Good afternoon, Las Vegas. How are y'all? Um, as JB said, my name is John, and it is a great pleasure to be on stage with you today and being actually staying between you and another form of transportation called a flight home. So let's hopefully make this an enjoyable journey. Um, my first statement to you is I'm not a car guy. I'm a software guy, and I work with cars. And what I mean by that is I'm actually a developer. I started my career at Motorola back in the 90s, early 90s, actually late 80s, if I'm being honest. And the career was building software for these things called switches, cell phone switches, things to allow you to connect and communicate. Now, notwithstanding what you hear and see in front of you, I actually grew up most of, well, not most, maybe about a little bit over a quarter of my time in Mexico. So I speak Spanish. But I lived overseas for most of my Motorola career, China included. And so I started a company called Ellison Associates as a training company to teach people how to do business effectively. Little did I know how much business teaching I'd be doing. Anyways, there are three things out, or two things outside of that that bring us here today. The first is I had the pleasure of working with Motorola to open up what had previously been this closed product. When you bought a product way back, it was what you got. It was the software that was given to you by the company in question. It was the epitome of Ford Motor Company. You can have any car you want, so long as it's black. And we today call that a developer program or an app ecosystem. You know it as Apple's ecosystem, Apple's uh, catalogs, and you know it as Google's catalogs. In addition to that, the software that you found on your phone was closed and proprietary. And Ford was one, sorry, Motorola was one of the first to come up with this idea of, hey, can we take this newfangled thing called Linux and do something with it? And we did. And we shipped the first ever open source Linux-based cell phone in the world. Today, you would know that as Android, or derivative version of it called iOS. But Motorola was at the forefront of that, a stalwart company from the Midwest challenging and changing the business model. After a great 21-year career, I left. And I was doing my own thing, teaching financial math, hanging out when Ford found me. And they said, hey, would you write us a software strategy paper for the connected car? And I said, sure, and I did. And they liked it. And so then they hired me to be the global technologist. And for three years, I wrecked havoc on Dearborn, challenging people with the way they think, the way they do, the way they work. We were the ones to create product that was open source. We convinced Alan Mulally to take almost $10 million of software assets and open source it, call it something called smart device link, to allow you to bring your device into a car and to integrate all of the rich content into the vehicle, to personalize what had previously been this black automotive. And we went around the world convincing OEMs, or trying to convince OEMs, to jump on board. And it is in that journey that I learned how to say the four-letter F word 14 different ways in 14 different languages, because no one could believe that Ford Motor Company would be magnanimous to give away software, to open up the kimono, so to speak, and to teach people how to do business differently. After three years, I left, and I went back to my practice, and I'm now up to, there's eight of us, and we hang out in the world, and we work in this world where software and software strategy are key components of the embedded space and the IoT space. And we answer questions for people, what should you do, and how should you do it? In 1996, Andy Grove said, only the paranoid survive, and he wrote a book about it. And what we're gonna do today is show you the paranoia that is taking hold of the automotive industry and what the responses are, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But first, just a brief point on some background information. All of this started in 1886 when Carl Heinz did the very first patent for the gasoline engine. Carl Benz was the, this is Mercedes Benz. We're looking at that, 1886, that's a hundred and 20 year industry. And that is the industry that has set the pace for the industrial revolution. How to build, how to manage supply lines, how to create, how to provide personal mobility before we were even calling it personal mobility. And it has been a major point of our life here in the States and lives throughout the world. The epitome of that change is an advertisement that Ford Motor Company pulled out in the early 20s about opening the road to all mankind, inciting what became an infamous dream to go where no one's gone before, in the comfort and safety of this new vehicle called a car. And what roads they have been. Here are a few snapshots 
of the kinds of roads that we have today here in the States, in Europe, and in Asia. Massive, significant contributions in terms of engineering, in terms of landscape, in terms of economic impact, environmental impact. So significant, in fact, to the tune of something on the order of four million miles of roadways just in the United States of America as of close 2013. You'll find in all my numbers, transportation lags a little because I got a lot of stuff to count. A lot of stuff to count. And when the road, cars aren't on those roads, they sit in parking lots like this. And that has created a massive amount of introduction of newfangled technology to allow us to go vertical. But sadly and unfortunately, most of the parking spaces in the US are more like this. They're empty. Why are they empty? Here's why. At the highest end estimate, we estimate over 2 billion car parking spaces in the United States of America. That is inclusive of everything. Stores, doctors, everything. So a few more stats and we'll continue on with the juice of the matter. Today, in the United States, there's something called a car park. That car park represents all cars that are in the United States. It's about 245 million. It's about 1.1 billion for the world. That's inclusive of the 245. About 99.99% of the time in the United States, when you are in a car, you are driving with what they call intent and purpose. That means you are going from point A to point B with a reason. Long gone are the days that you're driving for pleasure or just driving. Not only that, 85% of the time you're in a vehicle by yourself, and these numbers are going to come play shortly. And then, unfortunately, sadly, and terribly, and tragically, 42 hours a year, roughly, on average, every commuter sits in traffic. So this is the background of the industry that has, in essence, defined who we are as Americans, who we are as the United States, and what we are as a global people. And this industry, 120 years old, is under an exceptional existential threat, actually five threats. I'm going to share those today and how they're responding. Threat number one, and probably the most interesting threat, is that the transportation industry, long the place for the professionals, is now the place for the non-professional. The domain of the traditional professional is going away. Cruise automation, one of the first and one of the most interesting. Young man by the name of Kyle Vogt, Started the company. How did he start the company? Because he started another company about gaming. He was an MIT dropout. Realized that people liked to play games, electronic games. Put a company together to have a video stream of people playing games. It was the first e-games. Amazon bought it for $1.1 billion US cash. He took that money, turned around and said, I hate to drive. So he turned around and created a company called Cruise with the stated goal of making autonomous packages that could be added to a vehicle for less than $10,000, professionally installed, and you could drive any car made after 2012 autonomously. And the industry derided him, GM, Ford, Chrysler. And then he got a license from the state, and then he put a video out showing it, and then he got some funding in addition to his $1.1 billion. And then all of a sudden, fancifully enough, GM bought him just a few months ago. In addition, we have some other startups coming on. We have physicists who have figured out how to use electric motors to create drivetrains independent on wheels. And they've created a really cool car that can go forward or backwards or even sideways. There's no concept of a front or back. And the designer took that and said, well, wait a minute. If there's no concept of a front or back, I don't actually need to have a dashboard. I can create a whole new car construct that doesn't have a dashboard, which, by the way, doesn't have a radio. It's a whole new car concept. And probably the most incredible, most interesting, and most challenging change that is coming right now to the automotive industry. It's coming from a company called Local Motors. That car right there is called the Strati 3D. It was a 3D printed car. It is available today on sale. It went on the market 2015 here in Vegas at SEMA. Now everyone, whenever I talk about this, says to me, John, I don't believe you. A 3D printed car? That can't possibly be wait. It just can't work. Watch. And the automotive industry responded to that, well, 
real car companies get cars and movies. Local Motors said, okay. First example of response by the OEM, all OEMs banded together, went to Congress, and put into place legislation that creates a limit on the number of vehicles that local motors can produce. But it's not limited to local motors, it's not limited to a company. Down in the right-hand corner of the screen there is George Holtz. He's today 26. Ten years ago he was 16. At the tender age of 16, he broke the very first iPhone ever, the security package. It's called pawning. He decided he didn't like and didn't trust the software that came from cars that he would buy. So he said he was going to write his own software. So he bought a Honda Acura for $32,000, bought some stuff online, and built an autonomous package, and is today driving around the streets of San Francisco, albeit illegally, doesn't have a cert. But he's been backed by VCs on Sand Hill Road to the tune of about $3.5 million. He has a standing bet with Elon Musk that if he can build a better autonomous package and software sensor system, Elon Musk will entertain putting it into the Model S. But it doesn't stop with there. You've seen and heard Google. Google actually said very early in their time, listen, we don't believe that you can go from this idea of human-controlled vehicles to computer-controlled vehicles on a logical step. There has to be a natural break. They had research that suggested to them that no possible way could a human being take over control in that instantaneous moment when the computer said, oh my gosh, what do I do? That there was no way for that to possibly happen. So they went all in. And four years ago, they created this vehicle that you see right here. You'll note in the second picture right here, it has no steering wheel, no gas pedals, no brake. The response from the automotive industry at large was to deride them, to call that incredibly, incredibly, incredibly foolish. A failure in engineering. And then not even six weeks ago, to much trumpeting in social media, Ford Motor Company unveiled that it will in fact produce an autonomous, fully autonomous vehicle in the year 2021. And guess what? It will have no steering wheel, no gas pedals, or brakes. The response to the companies that are coming in is denial, legislative, holy crap, it's actually going to happen, and we better do something about it. Example one. And what's really cool is it's not just the car industry. The guys from Google believe that they can do this for trucks. And in fact, they went off to a startup and created Auto that just got bought by Uber for $685 million because Uber now believes that they can actually do self-driving in trucks as well, which is a huge industry, about a trillion dollars, just a little less than a trillion dollars in our US economic impact. Big deal. And so here we go. Some insights are coming. What's happening with all that's going on here? IBM did a report trying to figure out, and there's a number of them in there, but IBM tried to do a report to say, hey, let's go talk to the auto execs and find out what's going on. And then the auto execs, there you go. You can take a look at it right there. 19% felt that they were prepared for what's going to come to them in 2025. And about 71% said, hey, I'm somewhat prepared, and oh, wow, 10% they weren't prepared at all. But then it gets even worse. They went and they said, hey, how adaptable are you? 33% said that they were adaptable to the facing of challenges that were going to be coming in about the next 10 years. About 59%, hey, we're somewhat adaptable, and about 8% they're not adaptable, which then got PwC to come across with the following quote. Well, let's be very clear, ladies and gentlemen, probably in about 10 years, so in about 2025, many of the major automakers that we know and love today will no longer be around. And the incumbents are challenged by this, courtesy of my friends at Venture Scanner. We have gone from an ecosystem of tier one suppliers, top down, very regionalistic, we know what's going on, very disciplined to, oh my gosh, it's the wild, wild west, and anybody who has an idea can in fact come in and is in fact coming in. Now why are they coming in? Let's take a quick look at that. Threat number two is your digital life, that life that you live online, has worth, has a lot of worth, and it's one of the biggest reasons why all these incumbents, sorry, all these newcomers are coming in and challenging the incumbents. So what are you worth in your internet traffic? Here we go. One of the guys that works for me, we do this as a study for our clients, about 
three years ago. We started in 2013. And what we did is we took a, uh, a thing from Privacy Fix, we put it into his browser, and we said, hey, let's go look at what happens online for a three-month period. And Privacy Fix comes up with a really nice report, and that report has these icons. And so in this period of time, it's about three months, into August of 2013, a colleague of mine, we studied. That's what he did. But then Privacy Fix says, hey, we take this and we're going to figure out, we're going to pass it to something called Trefus.com. Trefus.com is a company out of Boston very similar to, excuse me, like Morningstar. They track the ad word economy for Google. And in the case of my buddy, Kevin, who is my colleague, his uh, per period of time, his three-month period of time, was worth about 565 hard cold curd dollars from the brands to Google to nuance his life. But it didn't stop there. They also looked at something called Google Analytics, that thing that you'd use as a webmaster. And about 25% of the sites also had Google Analytics. So not only were they giving away, you paying cash, they were also giving away all this rich data as to what this person, Kevin, was doing online, when, where, why, how, what. But it didn't stop there. It also incorporated the Facebook Like button. And over 94% of the sites who had nothing to do, nothing to do, passed data to Facebook, who wasn't involved at all, just because they had a little thumb up and thumb down, because the terms of service said, whatever you get, we get. What was interesting to note for this particular insight was that Kevin was using one machine, but he has lots of machines at home, whether they're laptops, you know, desktops, whether they're his Android phone or his wife's phone. He's all in on the Android Google ecosystem, so much so that last year, end of 2015, we estimated his impact economically to Google at about 5,500 US dollars. One family, family of four, Chicago land area. And so with that in mind, it's no wonder that Apple and Google and others are coming and trying to do what they do inside of the car. Remember those numbers. 99.99% of the time, you're in the car for a reason. 85% of the time, you're by yourself. And 42 hours a year, you do nothing but stick in traffic. Man, that's rich. Oh, and by the way, when you're in a car, because it's 99.99% .99 of the time you're doing something, I, how cool would it be for me to know where you're going so I could influence what you do and where you, where, how you get there? So Apple and Google are coming in, but what are they actually doing? Right there, every car company has a connected car. So the response was, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll do connected. We'll do connected. So we'll put software in. We'll make it cool. And unfortunately, it's not cool. Kelly Blue Book comes out and says it's problematic. Consumer Reports comes out and says it's actually terrible. And sure, a lot of our consumers respond back, this is terrible. This is an absolutely horrendous experience. But everyone's got one, and they're branded. And then all of a sudden, Apple and Google say, well, look at that. You have 25, 26, 27, 28 different experiences. No wonder everyone doesn't like you. We know what we can do because guess what? For 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you're under the tender age of 18, that phone's with you all the time. If you're between 18 and 35, it's with you plus or minus one foot. If you're over 35, it's plus or minus three feet. The phone's with you all the time. And you know that ecosystem. You know that UI. So guess what we're going to do? Ford Motor Company and all the others, we're going to come to you and we're going to make your life easy. We're going to give you our software. We're just going to give it to you. It's a gift to God. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And so what you're going to have is what you have up there. And then all of a sudden you add Apple and there you go. Dumb, boom, gone are the brands. Gone are the sub-brands. In fact, in 2013 at the Geneva Con uh, Convention Show, where the automotive companies were showcasing, or 2014, where Apple was coming out with, they had a Kia on stage for $28,000. You know who the other car was on stage? It was a Ferrari for $110,000. Both had the same interface. And one journalist said, oh, go look at the Apple cars. Now, what's interesting to note is Toyota is one exception that's not doing this. We don't have time in today's session to go into it. When you leave from here, you're going to get slides and an information cited package, and we'll be able to give you the link as to what Toyota is doing. So what's interesting is what, what's next is anyone with a mobile digital ecosystem, the car companies think they're only worrying about Apple and Google, and they totally miss the point. Everyone who has a platform ecosystem is coming hard because they want to capture you, and they don't want to lose you to others. So you're looking at Amazon. They have Alexa. Alexa's trying to get into the car. Amazon's trying to get in the car. You have Microsoft with Cortana. Cortana. They're trying to get in the car. They're trying to get Bing into the car. You have Facebook coming in with Oculus Rift. Baidu, who is the Chinese version of Google, just announced their own China car. It looks remarkably similar to the Google car, except it's in Chinese. This is happening, and it's happening fast and furious. Which brings us to threat number three. These ecosystems understand your value. And because they understand your value, I have created a concept, which is part and parcel of how this presentation came to life, called the zero-dollar car. And the zero-dollar car is coming far faster to the industry than anyone anticipates or understands. So what is the zero-dollar car? Oh, wow. The imagery did not look like that this morning. OK, that's a car with sensors on it. I don't know what happened to it. That's a car with sensors on it. There's lots and lots of sensors on it. And if I show that picture to my friends out of Dearborn or whatnot, they say, holy cow, look at that. That's the most remarkable engineered car ever. It will save the lives of people. And they're right. 
In fact, they're terribly right. And they do that because of this particular picture. And that is 38,300 lives were lost in the U.S. alone due to vehicular accidents in the year 2015. So the engineers say, that we have done all this cool work to create this car with cool sensors to stop that number or to reduce that number. But then I bring it to the West Coast friends, and they're like, well, wait a minute. But look, look at that, John. Look at that picture. What if we were to take these sensors and combine them together? We'd get some accurate weather. And what if we took these sensors, we'd combine them. We, 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 hey, they're for traffic. I get, well, sorry, you guys did it for, for collision avoidance. I can use it for traffic. I now know exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. I don't have to guess why you're stopped. Oh, and that wonderful, most incredible you know, sensor that was created, the microphone, so that you can keep your hands on the wheel, eyes on the road, safety, is really impressive when 85% of the time you're alone in your car, and 99.9% .9 of the time you're you want to go somewhere, so you're going to talk to your car in a way, hey, take me to Starbucks. What's near me? What's around me? How insightful is it? I can tell if you're a man or a woman, young or old. I can give all sorts of demographic information coupled. This is why we want the sensors. And so in the scenario that I paint out, we're going to go and take all these, all these sensors, and we're going to package them. The first one was weather. That's package one. The second one is package two, uh, which is your traffic. And we're going to start selling them. In this case, $7,000, $6,000, $4,000, $7,000, et cetera. I'm going to sell them as a package. Now, who's going to buy them? People that are going to buy them are agencies. So NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric uh, Agency, that agency is charged with trying to figure out weather impact. So for instance, we just had Hurricane Matthew. Before that, it was Hurricane Sandy. $60 billion of economic loss with Hurricane Sandy. And if they had had better, accurate, more up-to-date information, they could have had it by, down to about $20 billion. So their answer is to try and put more, more information out, or more sensors to get weather. Well, when they found out that they could potentially buy weather packages like this, they were like, I'm all on board for that. And then every state, unbeknownst to most of you, has a requirement to drive every one of the miles of roads that are in their state to ensure something called drivability, so that they can respect it and repair it. And when they found out that they could buy data, that they didn't have to drive, and that the data was accurate, and more importantly, it was the data that you were actually generating because you were driving the road, they're like, wow, yeah, no, we're on. Absolutely. And then you've got insurance companies who want to understand how you're driving and what's going on there and whether or not you're a good driver, bad driver, other driver. And then, of course, you have all the brands who want to understand what's happening. Why are you in the car going from here to here? And if I know why you're doing that, maybe I offer you that $2 latte or that $5.50 latte that you normally would buy for $5 if you just take a one-minute deviation. That's why brands want in. That's why they want the sensor data. And now, when we go, let's go take a look at this. I'm going to go to Ford. I'm going to go to Village Ford. So I'm going to go to my Ford dealer, and I want Ford to sell me this. So when I go there, I'm going to sit there and say, great. I want to buy a $40,000 car, Mr. Ford. And they're going to be like, that's fantastic. No problem. Before you sign the paperwork, before, you know, on, on behalf of Ford and in perpetuity, we want to sell you the weather package for $3,000. Just sign here. And oh, before you go, we want to buy the traffic package for $2,000, and so on and so on, until we get down to $0. And I'm like, wow, that's great. Really? You're just taking money off the type of price? Yeah, 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 we're just taking it off. But you're giving us all the rights to your data. Oh, OK, that's pretty cool. And so for those of you who are really smart, not, not anxious to get off of here, you're like, wait a minute. You just sold $60,000 worth of packages, but yet you just sold $40,000 of data. So what the heck? With the, where's the $20,000 difference, John? Aha. Uh -huh. That's why the platform companies want in. They understand that they can monetize this in ways that are unbelievable. Now, when I first started this, I said Ford could do this. Here's my threat number three. Ford can't do this. Chrysler can't do this. BMW can't do this. Because they are stuck in an EBITDA-based, volume-centric business model. They don't understand how to do this. They don't understand how to take money. They don't know how to sell. They don't know how to do this. Now, they sit on the sidelines, and they see what Google can do, and they're scared because they believe, they want to believe that they can do it. But fundamentally, they are challenged because they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the competencies, they don't have the capabilities. And so they look, and what the response is, is we won't sell data. And they try and legislate, and they try and respond. Scenario two, you remember the value proposition was $5,500 per for my buddy Kevin. Well, these ecosystems know that if you start using them and then you spend time with them, what happens is you're more valuable. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to go in there, and we're going to actually get the ecosystems to give you the $5,500. And you know what? You'll do it. Why? Because it's in your DNA. In fact, Google started to do this in 2007 when they first came up with the idea of the phone. Um, at the time, Eric Schmidt, CEO and chairman, said, hey, I'm going to give away free phones, paid for by advertising. And that kind of freaked everybody out. That model freaked everybody out. But the idea was right. What he made a mistake in it wasn't free. It wasn't free. You were selling your data. And that wasn't transparent. 
And so the idea died. But we're now at a point with transparency and understanding that that idea is going to happen. Threat number four. Everything, all of what we're talking about, comes because of connectivity. And what you don't understand is that the systems that we've built, the phone, the cars, the trucks that we've built, are built on systems designed back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. We fundamentally have an insecure system that's being connected voraciously with connectivity options. And it is a huge and looming security threat. Our first connected car was in 1922 when the AM radio was introduced into the, uh, excuse me, uh, Chevy. And not only that, we've been doing connected car-to-car -car communication since the early 70s when these gentlemen tried to do something. What that has brought to mind, though, is this concept of cars are hacking. And what happened in 2010 is the first paper was written about hacking a car using something at the time called Bluetooth, Bluetooth being the idea of connecting your phone into the car. And then that paper was followed by an actual hack. And then a paper was written in 2014 by Chris and Charlie that outlined a car hack. And then they actually did the car hack. And what that did, that video went out and it went viral. And in less than 72 hours, NHTSA issued the first ever software recall and the fastest ever recall in 72 hours. 1.4 million vehicles were called back. The response from Chevy was to investigate legal action against Chris and Charlie. At the same show that Chris and Charlie demonstrated this hack, a couple of other folks came up and showcased a Tesla hack. And what is interesting, and for you as technologists to understand the difference is, halfway through their presentation, these gentlemen invited a special guest up on stage. And who joined them was J.B. Stowell, the CTO of Tesla. And he gave them two security medallions, thanking them for their service, paying them money under a bug bounty program, and then pointing to a whiteboard in the back saying, if you think you can hack Tesla, we have HR in the back, not lawyers. We want to hire you. Tesla wanted to hire them. And as he was walking off stage, he just smiled with a Cheshire cat grin and said, for those of you who bought Tesla, thank you. This was fixed three releases ago. Point being is that there is a way to do this the right way. But the industry is refusing to understand or respect that because they were a hardware first industry. And the transformation to become a software first with hardware second is truly huge. Some will win and some will lose. And the hacks continue. Tesla then had a remote wireless hack. And again, they paid, they said thank you, and they proved that it was fixed three releases earlier. And what was most probably damaging and interesting is University of Michigan just released a big paper about the big rig hack, i.e. semis. And so the next question that you have to ask yourself with this profile is, when will we see an attack on our trucking system? We live in a very dangerous time with some very interesting things, and the software is at play. And what's happening is the hacks are becoming more and more understood and more and more prevalent, and common people are beginning to see and understand them. And more importantly, we're putting more and more access into our vehicles. This is becoming so concerning that companies like Argus released a report saying, hey, be careful, your dongles are dangerous. And they proved it. And then the FBI released the first ever sort of safe sex version of public safety for your car. Be careful of what you connect. Be careful of getting into a vehicle with something that's connected. Now I'll leave you with this quote that you can read here from Gene Spafford, give you about 15 seconds. Now Gene Spafford isn't some kook, he's a renowned security researcher out of the University of Purdue and he issued this quote about 20 years ago and every year People go back and ask him for the state of the quote, and he just affirmed the quote again in May of 2016. So threat five, threat five that we have, is coming because of this construct of all the data and all the software and our movement and our run-in to give ourselves away in something in return. And so the question that's now being asked in Germany is do we have a right to be forgotten? And Germany has said yes, and they're now forcing Google and others to search result change, remove information about an individual or an entity. And in fact, Germany's going after a pan-European movement. And what people don't understand is if in fact they're successful, that in fact someone says there is indeed a right to be forgotten, then there is an implication on the other side that some of us, somebody, has an obligation to make that right fulfilled. And as technology providers, you're in the room, this should concern you. It is only beginning to concern the automotive. They're only beginning to understand this. They've never had to worry about ship and remember. 
They've always been ship and forget. I give you the car, I sell you the car, and I walk away. The dealers are independent, the third parties are independent. I don't care. You want more money from, you want me to do something? Buy another car. But now they have to think about this. And so the question that's in front of everybody, us, you, the auto industry, the transportation industry, is do we have to begin to build product with the big red button that says, upon the exit, I hit the button and I'm forgotten. My drive is forgotten. Where I went is forgotten. How I was forgotten. And then is there a new business model that comes out of it? That if you hit the red button, you pay $2 for a mile driven because we're going to erase your data. But if you give us your data, it's only 20 cents a mile driven. Is that the new business model? And right on the tail and the, he the, the, the heels of the right to be forgotten is privacy. In a world where everything is connected, whether it's our home or others, in a vehicle that I can turn the mic on and there's no indicator that the mic's on, if I can turn the mic on, I'm going to put cameras in the car, sensors in the car, I have weight sensors in the car, I know if there's a child in the car so I know how not to deploy the airbag. I know if there's people in the back, I can pretty much accurately determine how many people. By listening, I can figure out what's going on. So in all that, do we now have to start contemplating warning labels for the vehicles that you buy or the vehicles that you get into that look like this? Now again, you laugh, and that's kind of what happens when I give this talk to other people. They laugh. And they're like, yeah, God, John, that's kind of ridiculous. But then I was in the state of California in June at another convention, giving them a talk, not about this, but some other stuff. And I walked on the show floor, as I did yesterday, interviewing some of you, trying to understand your motivations for being here. And when I walked on the stage, and when I walked through there, I happened to come across the following. We already are beginning to understand that life as we know it is changing. And so the question as technologists is, what do we do about it? And right now, the companies, Ford, Chrysler, GM, they're so concerned about some other things, they haven't even thought about this yet. But the new guys coming out, whether they're from Israel, London, China, Silicon Valley, right here in Las Vegas, they're thinking about it, and they're trying to create new product and new challenges, which are challenging the governments and challenging the companies. Now, all of this comes because of the following. Software is eating everything. It's an infamous quote that came from Mark Andreessen. And his comment was that software, a software-first perspective, allows rich latitude in thinking and in creating. And everything is being eaten by software. He was quickly followed by David Kirkpatrick, a renowned journalist, who said every company is now a software company. And what he was trying to convey to people is that you, who used to be EBITDA-based, volume-centric, big volume ship, I forget about it once it's gone, that business model is dead. You're a software company. You are going to be building software that's going to convey exceptional value, and the carcass of that value will be the thing you used to call your product. But the real value for you is software and the data and the business models that it enables. And if you as a company cannot get your head wrapped around it, you will not be long for this business world. Anne Rand, writer, author, is quoted as saying, we can evade reality, but we cannot evade the consequences of evading reality. Ladies and gentlemen, I was asked to give you some, what are the GMs and the Chryslers and the BMWs doing? And they're doing some things. Ford's trying to create a Ford Mobility Company. BMW's trying to acquire. GM's trying to acquire. And they're trying to move. They're not putting their head in the sand. They're trying to move. The problem is the movements are limited. They're small. They're traditional movements of a company who's not trying to destroy its current business. In fact, Mark Fields was quoted in March when asked, with this new company that he created for mobility, will the people be allowed to build product for competitors? And he said, no. We're not going to build to destroy Ford. We're going to build to extend Ford. It's a noble thought. But for those of you who understand process and transformation, it's not enough to say no. You have to change yourself or you will be changed by others. And my favorite all-time quote 
from my favorite purported Chinese curse is may you live in interesting times. Today is by far the most interesting time on any dimension that you can measure. Technology, economics, the world, human suffering is, de is, is depreciating. We're doing wonderful things with technology. All that stands before us is the decision to make a decision to do something, to embrace the new digital revolution, to adopt the new business models, and to look at our history through the lens of niceness and, hey, it's in the past, and to look forward with opportunity and richness. I enjoy and welcome you on the journey of this most interesting time. Thank you very much.